Hi everyone, it's 7 o'clock here in the UK. You are very welcome wherever you're watching us around the world this morning. We're still on the roadmap out of lockdown in England, but we've been delayed in reaching that final destination. Many of Boris Johnson's MPs are asking, will we ever really get there? We'll dissect the PM's decision to move so-called Freedom Day to the 19th of July with the Cabinet Office Minister Michael Gove very shortly. And we'll put Labour's argument to him that all of this could have been avoided if we'd closed our border to India much, much sooner. Been banging on about that, haven't we, for days. Also this morning for you, how tweeting can be good for you, this sort of tweeting. Joined by the man who says a daily dose of birdsong is a secret to coping with anxiety. That's at 9.30. And then at 9.45, back of the net, we'll build up to Friday's crucial Euro 2020 match between England and Scotland. Harry Redknapp joins us and he's going to be talking through the highlights of the tournament so far. It's Tuesday, the 15th of June. Boris Johnson sets a so-called terminus date to remove England's COVID restrictions, but Sky News meets those who wonder if we'll ever get to the end of the roadmap. We can't really keep postponing because there will come a time when we will only be one of us left. Harvesting a trade deal, first details of the UK's first post-Brexit agreement with Australia, with concerns about how it might impact farming. A worthy adversary, President Biden says he hopes to work with Vladimir Putin on areas where cooperation is in the interests of both the US and Russia. Pandemic pupils, the NHS launches specialist care to treat the rising number of children suffering from long COVID. Missed tumours are warning that 10,000 fewer breast cancer patients started treatment in the last 12 months compared with the previous year. Good morning. Very hot yesterday. Hot to say the year so far with 29.7 Celsius, 85.5 Fahrenheit at Bushy Park in Teddington. It might not be quite as hot today, but for many, there's still lots of strong sunshine to come. Hi, everyone. A very good morning. So the 19th of July is the new date for your diary. That's when Boris Johnson says he hopes to end all COVID restrictions in England. It's now all about ramping up the vaccine programme with a warning that easing limits next week could lead to thousands more deaths. But some of his own backbenchers are questioning the move with many sectors of the hospitality industry describing it as a devastating blow and uncertainty for some hoping to tie the knot, as Laura Bondock reports. We just thought we'd do it like a little book. The spare wedding invites can now be sent out. Kat and Phil have already moved the date four times and they don't want any more delay because Kat has terminal cancer. I want to be able to make that commitment to Phil whilst I am as well as I can be and, and Phil to me as well that we are married and that we're making a commitment to each other for whatever amount of time that we have left together as a as a married couple. Kat's diagnosis came just two weeks after they got engaged. Their big day now much smaller but just as longed for. It's hugely important I think well, certainly to me yes. um, to yeah. both of us just to to be with friends and family and to have a, a proper wedding celebration. I can't really keep postponing because there will come a time when we will only be one of us left. We're seeing cases growing by about 64% per week and in the worst... The latest guidance says weddings can now go ahead with more than 30 guests, but social distancing stays and dancing inside's not allowed. There'll be no dancing for another month at the Royal Albert Hall. Staff here were braced for bad news. They've only managed four concerts this year and now have £60 million of lost revenue. I feel like we're the last industry to be to be opened up. And I think I just felt, ah, oh, no, another month, another month of not being able to do what we do. We had James Blunt, we had Superman in concert, we had a strongman competition. I mean, you know, very roll out of all, weird and wonderful things. We'll have to now either cancel or reschedule most of those. Like Everyone in hospitality is struggling. Nathan Clark runs Brudenell Social Club, an iconic music venue in Leeds. It's not only about survival, it's about recovery. And the recovery is going to be the biggest thing. And I think the thing that all of hospitality will be calling out for is an actual plan, um, extensions to 
the VAT deferrals, extensions to the rent moratorium. The four-week delay allows more time for vaccination and ministers hope restrictions will then be lifted for good. In the meantime, though, for many, it's yet another month of uncertainty, lost business and lost income. Laura Bundock, Sky News. Delighted to say the Cabinet Office Minister, Michael Gove, is with me now. Hello. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. morning. Um, Labour says you should have moved at lightning speed to close the borders uh, with India, as you did with Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, you didn't because of a trade uh, deal photo op uh, with the PM of India. That's true, isn't it, according mm. to Jonathan Ashworth? Well, that's what Jonathan says, but actually it's not true, no. Um, we closed our borders. We put India on the red list at the earliest uh, appropriate opportunity on the basis of all the evidence that we had. In fact, we put India on the red list before we knew that this Delta variant was a variant of concern. You say that. However, looking at the uh, test and trace figures for the 25th of March to the 7th of April, India was a bigger concern than Bangladesh, and, that you, and yet you put Bangladesh on the red list, but not India. We put Bangladesh and Pakistan on the red list, and that's yeah. because the advice at the time from the Joint Biosecurity Centre, the team of experts uh, who help us to determine when action should be taken, was that the positivity rate of those coming from Pakistan and Bangladesh merited that. Um, and then, of course, we subsequently put India on the red list. But when we did put India on the red list, uh, it was the case that the Delta variant uh, wasn't then a variant under investigation, never mind a variant of concern. But according to the figures, you know, India is the middle one of these bars and Bangladesh was put on the red list, India was not. And these are your own test and trace figures. Yes, but there was a higher positivity rate um, overall for people coming from Pakistan and Bangladesh. And it's important to remember that even before India was put on the red list, anyone arriving from India uh, had to self-isolate for 10 days, quarantine at home, mm. in order to ensure that they weren't spreading the virus. Yeah, quarantine at home is very different to quarantining in a hotel, of mm. course, isn't it? And a lot of people uh, either quarantine at home with other family members there or don't quarantine at all. Yes, and of course, one of the reasons why we put India on the red list was to have even stricter measures. But of course, it is the case that there's been enforcement of uh, uh, home quarantine. So when people have breached those rules, they have been fined. Um, and it's very important that everyone uh, uh, appreciates that there are enforcement measures in place. And it is the case that uh, when advice was given to Matt and to the rest of us in government, that we took the appropriate action. And the idea that um, the Prime Minister would put the nation's health at risk because of a photo opportunity um, with any other Prime Minister is just for the birds. So you completely, um, as far as Labour is concerned, making that allegation, saying it was a trade deal photo op, absolute nonsense. Total rubbish. Do you regret, with the benefit of hindsight, we love 2020 hindsight, do you think we should have put India on the red list earlier? Well, it's always the case that uh, uh, people use hindsight. I mean, it's become a Labour's preferred method of viewing all decisions. Um, but I think that we can only act on the basis of the evidence that we have at the time. OK, so looking back, do you wish that you'd put them on the uh, red list earlier? Well, Given I... that we know what we know now and the fact that the numbers are doubling every week... With perfect hindsight, there are many, many things that we've done in the past, that I've done in the past, that I wouldn't have done at the time. Um, like but you what? Can, well, you can only like act... What? Well, that's another interview. Okay. You can only act on the basis of the information you have at the time. OK. Um, one of the reasons uh, put forward that people don't isolate or haven't isolated always up until now is the unsatisfactory isolation payments. Should we look again at compensating people for staying at home because they're going to work because they need the money? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the isolation payments work, but we keep everything under review. And it is the case that we provide support for people who do have to self-isolate um, and where there, there, there is an impact on their income. Uh, but again, uh, one of the things that we uh, seek to do is to make sure that we take decisions that balance support for individuals with making sure that we keep others safe as well. Do you acknowledge that it, we perhaps do need to look at that again, though, that there isn't enough money, which is why people are breaking? You know, they don't want to go no. to work, they just need the money. Well, we keep things under review, um, and uh, if there is evidence, um, then we'll look at it. But the evidence so far is that people understand the need for quarantine or for self-isolation, and that people, the overwhelming majority, are law-abiding and understand the, the requirements that the government has reluctantly put in place. 19th of July, terminus day. Um, are we finally, finally, finally going to see the end of these restrictions on the 19th of July? Or is it just the end of the tram stop and we go round again? No, that, that will be the terminus date. Um, you did say that about the 21st of June, to be fair. Well, to be fair, what we said is that um, we won't uh, lift those restrictions before 
the 21st of June. In there, in the roadmap, it says not before. And the whole point about the roadmap was to build in a, a, an element of flexibility and caution. And what we want to do is to, and it is regrettable um, that we do have this pause before moving to step four. But what we want to do is to make sure that when we do make that move, um, that um, we don't go back. Because the worst thing for business, the worst thing for any of us, would be to open up again um, and then to uh, very quickly find that we had to reimpose restrictions. So what has to happen on the 19th of July for us to not uh, extend further? Well, w w we believe that uh, the vaccination programme, which has been a big success so far, can successfully vaccinate um, uh, uh, an even higher proportion of the adult population. We can make sure that uh, those who've been vaccinated once get that second vaccine and that we extend right the way down uh, the population range. And we hope by so doing that we can limit the risk of infection and also reduce the number of people going into hospitals and putting a strain on the NHS. OK, let me put it another way. What has to happen on the 19th of July for us to consider extending further? Well, uh, it would require, I think, an unprecedented and uh, remarkable alteration um, in the progress of the disease. Because it has been described as Hotel California. We can check out any time we like, but we can never leave these restrictions that we find ourselves in. You're saying, come the 19th of mm. July, we will definitely be able to uh, unlock and go about our business. Yes, and to be fair, even though the restrictions that we still have at the moment are, are, are difficult, um, there are a significant range of activities that people can now undertake. Believe me, you know, I'd love to get rid of all of the restrictions, but I think it's important that we, we maintain a sense of proportion. Um, and so there are some particular sectors of the economy that, that you know, that are uh, under greater degree of pressure, but the economy overall is, is performing well. Um, and many of the things that we hold dear, um, we can now do as a result of uh, the success of the vaccination programme and the progress that we've already made. Two and a half billion pounds worth of rent debt already in the uh, hospitality sector. Mm. Oh, they're gunning for you guys. They are not at all happy. Um, they cannot open for at least um, another five weeks. What would you say to them? Well, it is the case that we've already provided support for the hospitality sector. And it is the case, of course, um, that venues can open in a COVID-secure way. But, um, you know, both of us, I think, would like nothing more than to be able to uh, stroll to the bar, order a drink, uh, uh, gossip with friends um, and, and socialise as we, we have in the past. But... We need to exercise a degree of caution. It is the case now that you and I could uh, go to dinner, we could enjoy table service, uh, we could catch up on um, uh, mutual friends and so on. So social life can continue, albeit under restrictions. Um, and I think it's important that the hospitality sector is supported. But I also think it's important that we don't have a situation where we open up and then close down again. I think the hospitality sector would find that the most difficult thing of all. More financial support for the hospitality sector? Well, the financial support that the Chancellor has already put in place was intended to take account of, of any um, slippage in the date from the 21st the 1st of, June. of July. And then um, the uh, furlough scheme starts to taper off from the 1st of July, doesn't it? Oh, well, we're, we're, we're asking employers to play a, um, a, a bigger role in the they've furlough scheme. They've got massive debts. They need your support. But the system that we have is more generous than um, most similar countries. Um, and it's that, all... doesn't, that doesn't help the well, people that are struggling, does it, here uh, in this country? It's still the case that there will be furlough support until the end of September. Um, but we're just asking employers to pay... Um, uh, uh, a little bit of that furlough support. Um, and that's entirely in line with what um, other countries that have been going through perhaps even greater difficulties are doing as well. So although we're extending to the 19th of July, there won't be any more money than what's already been announced? Uh, well, the Chancellor deliberately decided to go long in terms of financial support. That's why furlough is there. That's why other support is there into the autumn. So in answer to my question, there won't be any more money than what's already been announced? What we've already announced, the Chancellor... And I, I think he's right, has calculated, will help support the economy. And all the evidence is that the, uh, the economy is performing better um, than many feared. OK. Um, when should school children um, have uh, their jabs? I think that's ultimately a matter for uh, the JCVI and for um, medical experts to advise us on. But you'd be very happy for your kids to have theirs as soon as? Uh, or I would follow medical advice, yeah. OK. Masks in schools, um, they have been scrapped. Um, should that be reconsidered, given that we've seen the virus spreading amongst kids? Uh, 
Well, it's spreading amongst younger people who haven't been vaccinated, but I think at, at every point we have to make a judgment. You know, yes, case numbers are rising, but it's also the case that uh, even though many restrictions um, are still in place, others have been lifted, for example, on weddings. Um, and, and, and the key thing is that we want to get life back to normal as quickly as possible, but we have to exercise a degree of caution so we can have some progressive relaxations, um, and, and, I, and I think that they're, they're balanced against the need to preserve public health. Um, staycations, only way forward, we're told this year by many of your colleagues that have yes. been sat there over the last week or so. You did go to um, the Euros yep. in Portugal. You got pinged, sadly. Yes. Uh, has that meant that you're thinking twice about going overseas? Yes. <laughs> uh, I haven't made any holiday plans yet. OK. But I'm guessing you're not going to be heading to the Scottish Hills or the uh, Welsh Hills because this new... Soup... Well, I probably will be going to Scotland. Well, you say that because this new soup to nuts trade deal with Australia, the, mm. the farmers are not at all happy in the United Kingdom. They feel that Aussie farmers having unfettered access to um, uh, across our borders with their lamb supplies will sort of cause all sorts of problems. Well, we support farmers, um, and we do so not just by providing them with uh, a direct financial support, but also by making sure that we uh, give them an opportunity to export their fantastic produce on the world stage. And I actually think that we should be confident about the quality of the produce that uh, uh, our, our farmers are responsible for. I think that uh, uh, opening up new markets for them worldwide, which is what the brilliant Trade Secretary Liz Truss is doing, is the way to make sure that we can um, not only keep our farmers successful, but also ensure that we have investment in the countryside. So you're not worried that, as they are, about uh, the Aussie lamb flooding into the United Kingdom and there being no market for UK lamb? Well, I'm like, I personally am a great fan of um, Welsh lamb and Me and you Scottish both. lamb. Uh, and I think that uh, consumers will be free to make that choice. But I think it is also worth pointing out that the majority of, of, of meat um, which is reared and raised in Australia goes to the Asian market, um, and that is their principal and growing market. Um, but overall, um, you know, Australia is a friend and ally, um, and I think that you know, there have been one or two points that have been made about Australia during the course of this debate that mischaracterise um, uh, uh, how Australian farmers operate um, and the opportunities also for UK farmers. So it's important that we maintain protections and support for farmers, but it's also the case that opening up trade barriers provides, or rather bringing them down and opening up new opportunities, uh, provides our farmers with a chance to, uh, to show on the world stage the amazing quality of UK produce. OK, I, I want to put this to you finally, if I may, and I need to read my notes because I want to be precise. Um, sure. The High Court has uh, found that you broke the law last week uh, in your department's awarding of a £500,000 contract to Public First, which was run by your friend and former Special Advisor James Frey, and that's a breach of the Ministerial Code. Matt Hancock acted unlawfully uh, over pandemic contracts, we're told. There was evidence that Priti Patel broke the code in dealing with her staff as well. Um, what do you have to do to get punished in the Cabinet? Well, uh, the first thing to say is that the decision to award that contract was not my decision. I'm very happy to defend it because we were operating under pressure at a time when uh, this pandemic requires us to act with speed. And it's important also to say um, that the, uh, the court didn't find any evidence that um, I had tried to uh, influence this particular contract. Um, and what we were doing um, across government at that time was responding to a very, very challenging situation. Um, and uh, the court found that there was no actual bias in the decision that was taken by others to award this contract. But acting um, with speed doesn't mean that you can breach the ministerial code. There was no breach of the ministerial code. Sure? Yeah. So when we come back to this in um, a month's time, you, you're absolutely standing by that? Absolutely. OK, fantastic. Just before I let you go, how disappointed are you that you didn't manage to go to the G7? They looked as though they were having a whale of a time. Uh, I was having an even better time. I was in Northern Ireland. Um, I was there for the British Irish Council. Um, so it was an opportunity for me to uh, say thank you to Arlene Foster, the departing First Minister of Northern Ireland. And Cornwall is lovely. But for man, I think, is even nicer. And that was better than, than a barbecue on the beach? Uh, yes, we had a very nice um, dinner with um, Northern Ireland produce, um, from uh, Loch Aran Eel to uh, local beef. And um, I'd recommend to anyone, if they're wondering where to go on holiday um, this summer and uh, Cornwall is booked, then try Northern Ireland. OK, good to talk to you. I have to let you go. Good chat forever. Uh, I really do want to come back again, though, about sure? some, of, yeah, some of the things that uh, you, you don't want to talk about uh, today, not least what things that you've regretted doing in the past. 
OK, OK, but it will probably take us a couple of hours. <laughs> OK, we you. can clear the schedule for okay. you. It's no problem at all. Thanks so much indeed. All right, thanks, Thank Kate. you. Thank Bear you. with me one second. Still to come on the programme for you. As the 30 guest limit is lifted for weddings, what difference will that make for those tying the knot? We'll speak to one couple now hurriedly rearranging their plans. That's just after half past seven. Why are so many businesses struggling to recruit staff during the economic downturn? Uh, Chef Mitch Tonks is desperate for new recruits and joins us at around 7.35. 8.20, we'll get the thoughts of the Shadow Health Secretary, uh, Jonathan Ashworth, on the delay to lockdown easing in England, just what we've heard also from Michael Gove within the last few moments. But before all of that, the latest unemployment figures um, have uh, just been released. Figures to April show there was a decrease in the unemployment rate to 4.7%. The number of people working increased for the sixth consecutive month, up by 197,000. Also making the news for you this morning, just talking about the Britain and Australia uh, announcement expected very shortly. They've agreed a post-Brexit trade deal, we believe. The Prime Minister held final talks over dinner with the Australian leader Scott Morrison in Downing Street last night. Both sides say they hope to increase trade between the two countries above the current level of £20 billion. 24 hours before he meets Vladimir Putin, President Biden has told NATO leaders the alliance is key to confronting the threat posed by Russia. Ahead of the meeting in Switzerland, Mr Biden said the Russian leader was someone who could be an adversary. 10,000 fewer patients in England started treatment for breast cancer in the last year. A study by Cancer Research UK suggests the delay is partly due to women staying at home due to concerns about contracting COVID-19. We think that COVID has really added to some of the barriers that people have already about seeking help and they're worried about overburdening the NHS. I can understand why that's the case, but their health is important. And if they've noticed anything unusual about their health, a change to their body, then I really would encourage them to make contact with their GP. And if they have trouble getting that appointment, to keep trying. Current and former BBC bosses will appear before MPs this morning to explain the corporation's handling of Martin Bashir's interview with the Princess of Wales. A recent investigation concluded the reporter acted in a deceitful way and faked documents to persuade the princess to take part. Despite an explosion and a huge fire, emergency services say no one was injured in this blaze in the American state of Illinois. An evacuation was ordered around a chemical factory in the town of Rockton, which is the largest producer of grease in the United States. NHS is launching specialist services to treat the rising number of children and young people suffering from so-called long COVID. Let's uh, talk about it in more detail. Shaman Freeman Powell joining us now from the newsroom. Hello to you. Tell us more. Yeah, well, there has been growing concerns about young people who say that they've experienced these long-lasting effects of COVID-19. And the truth is, is that there's still a lot that we don't understand about long COVID. And while young people and children are less likely to suffer from severe disease, according to the Office of National Statistics, around 13% of under 11s and around 15% of 12 to 16-year-olds reported at least one symptom five weeks after the initial confirmed COVID-19 infection. And this is quite serious because some of the symptoms range from fatigue to chest pains to serious impacts on people's mental health issues. So these uh, hubs, there will be 15 hubs set up around the UK. They'll be staffed with experts on the issues such as respiratory uh, symptoms and also uh, some of the fatigue. And they will work with families uh, and their GPs to address the issues and concerns that their families may have and to try and support young people. Because we must remember, these will be the last ones to be vaccinated. So a lot of money is being pumped into this, uh, to these hubs to try and support these young people. OK, for now, thanks. Uh, what's happening as far as the weather is concerned? It was glorious yesterday. What about today? Let's find out. Here's Kirsty. Kirsty, good morning. More of the same? 
a little bit more of the same, Kay, not as hot as yesterday. We got 29.7 Celsius, that's 85.5 Fahrenheit in Bushy Park in Teddington, that's in Middlesex. That was very hot, making the hottest day of the year so far. Temperatures just a little bit lower today. Let's take a look. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Good morning. A weather front through, went through last night, which means we've got a legacy of cloud towards the southeast this morning, and that means it won't be quite as hot today as it was yesterday. And up to the northwest, looking very different indeed, wet and windy weather moving in here. But for many, it will be a largely dry day with some lovely spells of strong summer sunshine, and we'll lose that low cloud in the southeast. It will brighten up here as well, but temperatures peaking more like 25 or 26. So not the near 30 we saw yesterday, but high, very high UV levels and high or very high grass pollen to watch out for. Slightly cooler in the north and west as wetter and windier weather moves in here during the day. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Coming up in just a moment or two, we're going to be speaking to one couple trying uh, to work out what new wedding rules mean for them as they get ready for their big day. This monastery is under the protection of Russian peacekeepers. I'm Dinah Magne and I'm Sky's Russia correspondent, based here in Moscow. They can't arrest everybody. I'm Stuart Ramsey, and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. The enormous explosion oh, has just come down. We saw snatch squads going in, grabbing people. You either live and recover, or you die. OK, so that's like a war. Let's do it. We help you understand the world with us. Over the past 24 hours, the soldiers have been attacked on a number of occasions. <laughs> really sending a clear message that Venezuela is eager for change. We take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. They were convinced the United States would become hooked. Well, they were right. We hear uh, shotguns being fired. It's not out of control, but the fib withdrawn. It's so, oh, so hot. My name is Fatma Zilzila, the founder of ICASA from Kuwait, where we face many environmental problems related to waste pollution, deforestation and lack of information. We are collecting recyclables from houses, schools and businesses in order to recycle them. In exchange for recyclables, you get a tree. Hello again. The government says it's confident lockdown restrictions in England will be eased on the 19th of July following a decision to extend them for up to four more weeks. Short time ago, the Cabinet Office Minister, Michael Gove, told this programme he believed the rules would be eased next month. That, that will be the term of the state. Um, you did say that about the 21st of June, to be fair. Well, to be fair, what we said is that um, we won't uh, lift those restrictions before 
the 21st of June. In there, in the roadmap, it says not before. And the whole point about the roadmap was to build in a, a, an element of flexibility and caution. And what we want to do is to, and it is regrettable, um, that we do have this pause before moving to step four. But what we want to do is to make sure that when we do make that move, um, that um, we don't go back. Because the worst thing for business, the worst thing for any of us, would be to open up again um, and then to uh, very quickly find that we had to reimpose restrictions. What has to happen on the 19th of July for us to consider extending further? Well, uh, it would require, I think, an unprecedented and uh, remarkable alteration um, in the progress of the disease. Well, our political correspondent Tamara Cohen is joining us now. So that's not definitely a no, Tamara, or is it to extending further? Well, I think Michael Gove, like Boris Johnson yesterday, Kay, is very keen to project the idea that they're very confident that if we just ease off the accelerator a bit, that in four weeks' time, when two-thirds of the adult population uh, will have been fully vaccinated, then we will be in the best position uh, to fight off uh, the Indian variant, which has seen uh, a very large uh, growth in cases over the last uh, couple of weeks and a, and a rise now in hospitalizations, and then be able to open up fully. Boris Johnson keeps using this word irreversible. He wants the end of lockdown to be irreversible. And if it couldn't be irreversible by loosening restrictions in England on the 21st of June, then we need to wait up to another four weeks. Now, to be fair, the government Government scientists were also pretty confident that with lots more vaccines going into people's arms by that stage, we would be in a better place to throw off all the social distancing restrictions. But there is some concern about the Prime Minister's continued use of this word irreversible. He wants to give people, to give businesses certainty. But Sir Patrick Vallance said yesterday that we would be living with COVID forever. And that's why we saw a number of Tory MPs pretty angry in the House of Commons yesterday, saying that they expected there will be more restrictions in winter, perhaps into next year, and that perhaps this lockdown would effectively never end. There are also more questions for the government about why India was not put on the red list earlier, given the problems that have been caused by the Indian variant, and whether more variants could come in, and as Michael Gove suggested, as a remarkable event, derail that date once more. Today, Labour are calling for all the amber list countries to be put on the red list instead to give a clear signal that foreign travel uh, should not be taking place. OK, Tamara for now, thanks so much indeed. And Mr Gove did also say there wouldn't be any more money in addition to what has already been announced by the Chancellor for the hospitality industry, despite the fact that they are going to find themselves having to be closed for another month longer than anticipated. Uh, no great surprises when the PM announced that uh, lockdown easing measures were being delayed for that uh, four weeks. But one piece of good news was that couples getting married will be able to have more than 30 guests, but they won't be able to set foot on the dance floor or to sing. Hayley Smith and Marcus Knight are less than a week away from their big day and they're with us now. Hello to you both. Hello, good morning. Hey. Good, good morning. morning, good morning. Talk to me about how anxious you were when you were listening to the Prime Minister speaking last night. I mean, probably about as anxious as we've been for the last, what, year yeah. trying to plan to plan the wedding? We're on our fourth date now and um, it doesn't get any easier. No, it's every, every time we've had to move it, it's just been more and more stressful. And um, we we knew we wasn't going to move it again, but the, um, the anxiety of having to drill down your guest list isn't fun. No, no I'm it's sure. Tough. Tough. So, so you, can, you can have more than 30 people. But they can't dance and they can't sing. How does that make you feel? Well, we love a good boogie, so that's <laughs> quite hard for us to process and the same with a sing song. But um, but for us, what makes things even more complicated is we have a, an outdoor venue and so the rules around that seem a bit, bit yeah, cloudier as, as to what can happen because it says that while not illegal, I think outdoors it says it's just not advised um, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of clarities you know there seems to be some rules that are contradictory about you can't have a standing up reception indoors or outdoors but these other rules that for outdoor weddings seem to be okay so at the moment we're still a bit in the dark about what we can proceed with. When he got down on one knee to propose did you ever think did you ever think that you would have to go through all of this palaver in order to tie the knot? <laughs> 
Absolutely not. It's been yeah. the longest engagement ever. Yeah, it certainly <laughs> felt that way. Um, I mean, you know, surely it shows our level of commitment. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, no one, no one could ever guess this. You know, planning a wedding is is difficult. Uh, you know, the best of times. Yeah, for, for, you know, for any couple at any any time. But but this has just been unbelievable. And you know, every time we've had to reschedule the wedding, it's not just about moving a date it's about making sure that all your suppliers are available for that date it's, it's trying to move it without you know costing more money and, and every time it just comes with us a, a great degree of sort of stress and uncertainty and it just feels that everything else is put on hold until the wedding happens so we're sort of in a constant state of limbo mm -hmm. and um it's just uh yeah it's it's not been great on our mental health no, no i'm sure that's true i'm sure that's true energy out why did you decide to keep uh, uh, planning the date? Why didn't you wait until we were totally out of lockdown? Well, I mean, we did. <laughs> so, you know, we, we thought we, this would be it. <laughs> yeah. So, we, you know, we moved it and we moved it. And like I say, you know, every time it's been really, really hard on our sort of mental health to, to stick with it. But, you know, we wanted to have the wedding the way we wanted to do it. For us, it was all about having friends there. It was about having a, a big party, mm. a big celebration. And so, that's why we moved it back four times, like three times to a fourth date. And um, and so that's sort of the gutting blow that, you know, even though we've decided it's the best thing for us to proceed ahead, no yes. matter what, and obviously with the extra guests, it, it's great, but it, we're still not sort of getting the wedding that we had planned yeah. for. And that's that's a little bit hard to, to, to process. Yeah. So what have you got planned then for the wedding? Um, well, a nice sit down meal in the forest. <laughs> yeah, we get married in the forest. Um, it all depends on the restrictions now because we have things like lawn games. Um, we have um, an illustrator there. Um, we've got some music. Re live music. So it really does depend on, on what the restrictions are, but um, it'll be a lot of fun still. And uh, we are really still looking forward to it. Um, it's just getting through the confusion now yeah. of and what we can and can't do. And how many people have you got coming along to help celebrate your big day? Um, about 70 to 80. Amazing, amazing. Which is, um, yeah, which is perfect. So when you, before you heard what the Prime Minister said last night, were you sort of hovering over the guest list with a big red pen? <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing that for the past couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's, um, and, you know, and we, we, we're glad, you know, we're glad we never had to make that decision mm. um, because it's just, you know, it, it's difficult, it's difficult, there's, there's, all these people that you want there and that mean so much to you and then and to be able to say sorry you can't come or even just sorry you can't come and you know and bring plus ones and things like that but you know I guess we would have had to have found a way to deal with it but yeah thankfully now at least that's just we can have all the people there we want apart from them. people that are coming in internationally because obviously that's a, a still a big issue and you know my my sister's in Florida and her family and so they won't be able to come to the wedding and so this is just another area of, of you know problems that we've, we've had to deal with in regards to um, people being able to attend yeah. the wedding. I understand the challenges that it's been uh, on both of you Hayley and Marcus but it's just one day it is an important day for the rest of your life but then it is a signal that you're spending the rest of your lives together and you'll be able to see your family and friends and you'll be able to introduce your babies to the family in the fullness of time so enjoy the day and be safe in the knowledge that it's the first day of the rest of your lives together. Exactly, exactly. For us, it's it's the day where we can. It's it's the first day past the pandemic for us, isn't it? Like from this point, we can we can truly move on. And it's just a day of celebration, celebration, yeah. our, celebrating us with our loved ones. And okay, don't matters. tell me what the dress is going to look like, but I bet you're going to look absolutely, as my son would say, banging. It's lovely to see you both. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks for us. a lot. Take care. Okay. Just gives you an idea of the sort of levels of stress that young people like that have had to go through during the last 18 months. Well, following the least release of the latest unemployment figures, there's concern amongst businesses about the rising vacancy rate. That's the increasing number of jobs that can't be filled even during the economic downturn. And why is that? Let's try and find out. Mitch Tonks runs eight seafood restaurants in Devon and Dorset, and he's with us now. Hi, Mitch. How are you? I am very well. Tell me the sort of challenges that you're facing at the moment trying to recruit staff. Well, we're in a kind of uh, strange time in that summer seems to have come very early to us in the southwest, so we're inundated with customers. And we are across our eight restaurants, 120 people short from running them at full, full tilt. So our teams are under a lot of pressure um, to deliver. Customers quite naturally want to get out after being locked down. And, uh, and we're seeing... 
applications really slow to the rates that they normally were would. Um, what has the last year been like for you and your staff? Because it's been, you know, it's been very hit and miss. You didn't know you you opened. I'm sure you did um, help out, eat out to help out uh, in August, and then everything was locked down again. And then we were open, then we weren't. So, what sort of impact has it had? Well, I mean, the first couple of weeks were really challenging while we were trying to work out whether we could survive, how we would get through it, and work a strategy for that. But actually, during the year, I think we kind of used the time wisely to sort of. Um, re-evaluate our business to make it better for our customers and our staff and, uh, and actually it was a very positive time and then last year we had uh, a bumper summer which was really really good and um, I think we would have finished the year pretty good um, if it hadn't been for the sec second lockdown so it's definitely been tough on staff but we've made a, a real point of kind of keeping in touch with people and keeping everybody engaged. Why is it so difficult to fill the vacancies? I mean I think you're looking at what 25 vacancies at the moment in your business? Well, we, we're across the eight restaurants, when we, when we get to the summer, we'll be 123 people, so it's quite a lot. And, uh, but normally we don't start recruiting um, for the summer until around sort of April time. So I think it's just a, a set of circumstances of people um, wanting to come on holiday earlier, enjoying the sunshine, wanting to get out. And we're on the kind of upward trend, but uh, at the upward sort of um, recruitment cycle. And I think that there are a lot of businesses down here that are looking, so there's a lot more competition. Um, I think people have had... Uh, a year off and or a year locked up and they're actually thinking they may have sort of re-evaluated re life and their priorities and therefore perhaps want a summer off. Um, universities haven't broken up yet and I generally think the situation will start to free um, as, you know, maybe, maybe furlough ends and people start to move around looking for jobs. But uh, I, I think this is a temporary situation but frustrating for all of us. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. Um, the extension to the 19th of July, terminus day, we're now calling that. Uh, what impact is that going to have on you and your business? I think we're all looking forward to getting back to normal, taking masks off. And, you know, I, th I, th I don't think we're going to start putting lots more chairs back in the restaurants. We're going to sort of keep it the pace that it is. But I think everybody was just looking forward to kind of like, this is normality now and it's really great. So it's a little bit of a you know, wading in treacle is a bit sticky, and um, but it'll be OK. But I just really feel for, like, you know, nightclub businesses and pubs that just haven't been able to open and, um, you know, lots of celebrations. I think that's the biggest impact. We had lots of people booking bigger tables at this time in our private dining rooms, um, ready to kind of do some family celebrations. And now this week, they're all going to have to be cancelled, so that's frustrating for them. Yeah. Uh, Mitch, I'm interested to hear you say that you're not going to add more tables back again. Why is that? I think it was one of the things that we learned in uh, in lockdown that we we just gave people a better time and the dining rooms were in a much better rhythm. Um, we can actually give better service. People have more space, and uh, and I think that was one of the mantras that we used during lockdown was let's emerge from this a better business. And I think that was part of it. Um, and as far as uh, your area is concerned, I was down there um, over the weekend for G7, beautiful parts of the world. What would you say to people who are watching this morning who are thinking about heading um, to your area for a staycation this summer? Well, you're coming to paradise. I mean, I, you know, people are heading down here because I think Devon and Cornwall are two of the most beautiful counties in the UK, wonderful coastlines. And uh, the one thing I'd say is that if you're going to a hospitality venue, you know, um, try and just understand that everybody is desperately trying to do their best, serve huge numbers and probably doing it with less resource than they than they had. So a level of understanding for for everyone in the industry would be really good. Indeed, sir. And make sure, yeah, and make sure you tip your waiting staff. Mitch, it's good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I would day. highly Bye. Bye. I would highly recommend it. A beautiful, beautiful part of the world. Um, coming in just a few moments, why 10,000 fewer patients have started treatment for breast cancer in the last year. We'll speak to one woman who's been affected. Coming next. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Take you to the heart of the story that shapes our world. Our job is to tell the truth. This is a forgotten front line. They are dying here. Here it comes. Cut. Boy, we've got some interesting ways of showing you what's going on. Their message to us: get ready. Got the lag pocket. Instructing you to stay at home. I can't believe we did that. It's pretty special, isn't it?
Chamber, the Carlos Puigdemont declared independence in October. And I want to show other people what happened. I'm Michelle Clifford and I'm Sky's Europe correspondent. It's not the aim of the smugglers to actually get people to UK shores, but simply into British waters. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. There are real concerns here now about whether the health system will be able to cope. Made by people who dare to challenge. Afternoon, Mr Barnier. I have no time for any polemics. Hello, or like we say in my language, the lake. I am Tonti the founder and the CEO of Renewables in Africa. This picture changed my whole career and my whole life. My mission is simple, is to bring back power to Africa. And our vision is to turn the dark continent that I saw in 2008 into a brighter and prosperous one by 2040. Did you know symptoms of hay fever can develop at any stage of life, not just in childhood? The Pollen Reports, sponsored by Philips Connected Air Purifiers. Today will be fine and warm for many, wetter and windier in the northwest. A rather grey start in the southeast, but the cloud here will thin and break. And for much of England and Wales, it'll be sunny and warm, not as hot as yesterday, up to 25 or 26. Cloudier and cooler to the north and west as outbreaks of rain move in across Scotland, Northern Ireland and the Republic and the winds pick up as well. Grass pollen levels are now high to very high across England and Wales, rising to moderate across Northern Ireland and Scotland. The Pollen Reports, sponsored by Philips Connected Air Purifiers. Now, Maradona was regarded as one of the world's greatest footballers and so organisers of one of South America's biggest football tournaments decided to pay a big tribute to him last night and it looked like this. Officials revealed this ahead of Argentina's Copa America match against Chile. The player's life was celebrated with a hologram show featuring images of Maradona throughout his career. There we go. And his number on his shirt as well. On the ground, is, is he going to score that goal? Of course he is. Never really missed, did he? There you go. Now, a leading cancer charity is warning that 10,000 fewer breast cancer patients have started treatment in England this year because of a backlog caused by the pandemic. The number of deaths from breast cancer in this country had reached an all-time low before the lockdown. Joining us is breast cancer survivor and campaigner, Helen Addis. Hello to you, Helen. Hi, Kay. How Lovely are you? Good morning, good morning. Lovely to see you. Um, first of all, just remind us about your story. So it was three years ago when I found um, my lump and, you know, I was 39 years old, no family history um, of breast cancer. So I actually wasn't worried. I thought it was something hormonal. Went to see my GP um, who agreed, yeah, there's, there's a lump there, but it's likely to be a hormonal. But let's... Um, uh, get you to see the breast consultant. Two weeks later, I saw the breast consultant and another four lumps have grown. Um, so that just goes to show how fast um, my cancer was actually going, which is why today's news um, absolutely horrifies me that, um, that uh, you know, there's such a delay in people starting their treatment because had 
my treatment being delayed outcome well I know my outcome would have been extremely different and they moved me very quickly into treatment which was you know ultimately life-saving yeah so if, if you had got your lumps this time now then you probably wouldn't be with us anymore well, it, exactly, because there is such a backlog now and people are having treatment delayed, uh, treatment cancelled. I've actually only just... I'm, I'm, I'm recovering at the moment from my reconstruction, which should have happened over a year ago, but that was delayed due to COVID. Thankfully, though, you know, reconstruction isn't life-saving surgery, so I can understand why that was delayed, but... Um, you know, it just goes to show the knock-on effect that's happening right now. There has been so much research into breast cancer and fewer people dying of breast cancer now than any other time uh, in history in the United Kingdom. But I suppose you and many other women and men are going to be anxious that given what's happened over the last 12, 18 months, that the research is not there as it used to be. Absolutely. I think that we have made great headway and we can't forget that breast cancer is the most diagnosed cancer within um, women. And we just, you know, the, the thing that really gets me is that COVID is now seen as the big C, whereas actually cancer to me and thousands of others is really the, 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 the big C that is still with us. And I cannot even begin to think the ramifications that this is going to cause over coming over the coming years yeah and she, absolutely helen i mean you work obviously to help uh, women uh, support them during this incredibly uh, traumatic time um i'm guessing a lot of women's mental health is suffering they know that they have cancer they fear that they have cancer and they can't do anything about it yeah. Absolutely. And um, I have uh, lots of people within the within my community that, um, in fact, one lady last week has gone in um, because she had a, a cancer recurrence, but she was have to had to she had to be told the news on her own because she wasn't allowed anybody in the room with her. You know, she's 31 years old. She's got a six month old old baby and she's told that she's got incurable cancer um it's unimaginable and even actually you know for the people that haven't been able to have reconstruction the the, the mental impact of that has been uh astronomical actually um and i think that i think that the cancer community is feeling very unloved right now and a little bit uh, forgotten about so what can the government do to try to uh, make you feel that love again? I think we need to get the screenings back up to speed. Um, I think that we need to be encouraging people to be going back to their GPs if there's anything that they see on their body that, that, that is unusual. I think people are still, still very scared about going to um, their GP if they, if they notice anything. Um, and I just think that there needs to be... Um, yes, some more funding so that we can catch up and get back on track to where we were before. I love your wall light. It's amazing. It's an official, the Titty Gritty uh, wall light, which, uh, yes. It's absolutely <laughs> superb. I love it. I want one. I don't know where you're going to get it from, but I'll ask you off air and I want one. It's lovely to speak to you, Helen. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you're on the Thank mend. Thank you. Can I just say... If anybody out there has any lumps, bumps, bleeding, discharge from the nipples, please get it checked out. Just get it checked out. It's not likely to be nothing, but do get it checked out. Yes, you can, and yes, you did. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So glad that it's uh, ended well for Helen. Just had her reconstructive surgery and all has gone well. She won't be out in the sun today, though, hopefully, although it, it is pretty sunny for most of us, isn't it? Kirsty. It is indeed. We have got some lovely sunshine to come today for some of us. It's not quite as hot as yesterday. And actually, although the heat will return tomorrow, we're looking at some thunderstorms to end the week. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. 
Good morning. Yesterday was the hottest day of the year so far. Temperatures peaking at 29.7 Celsius, 85.5 Fahrenheit in Teddington, Bushy Park in Teddington in Middlesex. Now, it won't be quite as hot today. A bit of cloud around first thing this morning, but still rather mild. Much of England, Wales, southern Scotland seeing the sunshine as the day goes on. But out towards the north and west, we are seeing thicker cloud moving in, bringing with it some wet and windy weather later on. So temperatures in the northwest, neither where they should be for the time of year. Still pretty warm towards the southeast, 25 or 26 and of course strong sunshine very high uv levels and very high grass pollen for some of us as well we'll keep an eye on the wet and windy weather it will move its way southwards as we go through the night tonight draped really from northern england through the irish sea by the end of the night that's where we'll have more cloud and spits and spots of rain coastal murk the southeast getting very hot again tomorrow the weather sponsored by qatar airways